Um, hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, let's, see. let's see. Oh, no, I'm wrong. There's still people coming in. Um, so as you probably got from the, now let's see, is Adrian here yet? Nope, not yet, but she will join us. Oh, there she is. See, I spoke too soon. Um, so as you probably gathered from the email that I sent out this morning, if you saw it today, um, we were brought a subject to talk to at the Platica today um, by Adrian um, at, at the Embudo Valley Library. So although we didn't seem to have a particular like subject or lesson plan or something, I guess you could call it for today. Um, I did send that to Katie uh, and to Melissa who is here. So they, that we could all kind of address this, um, which is a very, very good subject. So I'm actually gonna let Adrian and I will just jump straight in and then we'll talk afterwards. This won't, this doesn't have to be the only thing we talk about today, but it's a great thing to have to talk about. And I'm gonna let Adrian go ahead and tell us what she is thinking about and kind of the predicament with materials because it's a very good one regarding what to do with materials that might be require a little bit of explanation. So Adrian, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put you on the spot and let you uh, present your predicament. Good thing I just rolled in a minute ago from Santa Fe. So, yeah. um, hi everyone, I'm Adrian. Uh, I'm the archivist over at the Embudo Valley Library. Well, in, in partnership with the Embudo Valley Library. Um, my cohort, Rosalia Sidio, is not on, but that's okay. We'll get started. Do you want to wait? Um, gets here? Do you want to wait? No, I, I think it's okay. Um, we have started, we've gone through several iterations of how our project will look. Um, and the most recent iteration we found since COVID is not allowing us to go into people's homes and interview them so easily. Um, we've really started launching into the actual gathering archival objects and materials. And so we've invited people, um, we've begun the process of inviting people. And one of our librarians and beloved community members brought in two big binders that I have of information. Um, she goes to the Embudo Presbyterian Church. She's a historian in her own right. Um, her name is Charlotte Valdez, and she wanted us to pick through the two binders, which gives us, fortunately, an idea of some of the things we're going to receive and how to whittle down our criteria and what we ask of people, because we hadn't formally asked from her. Um, <clears throat> so part of the materials we're receiving are from a time period when the mission was very active within the area. So we're starting to see ways in which we're coming up against the conflictual nature of how to represent more than one story. We are in proximity and within what was traditional Picaris land. Um, we are definitely, um, I think our, our actual Spanish name is San Antonio del Budo. I'm sorry if I butchered it, but um, Rosa could speak more to that, but that's the, the name of the town when um, his, the Hispanic folks um, lived here. And so what we're getting is a perspective of history where um, there is some language about barbaric ways um, and not just towards native people here, but towards people who did not convert to Christianity um, that were or, um didn't convert to the Presbyterian way um, who were Hispanic here. And so we're trying to determine how to preserve, and I think this is a climate that probably most historian and archivists are dealing with, how to preserve artifacts, but perhaps not um, attitudes. And so we, I reached out to Shane and I was asking him how do we how do we present this? Because there's so many great juicy um, facts within our and and who lived where and where was that? And I think that it would be really awful to underserve the um, the artifact itself, the documents, if we were to 
say, well, we're not going to do anything that's controversial. Um, but how to, number one, couch something within the archive that gives it a better context that doesn't, we can run into um, acting like archives. If I was on the other side and I was receiving an archive and all its items, I could say, oh, well, that's the truth of everyone's history or experience. And so we're wondering how to better serve the broader picture and the complexities within it, because these are amazing um, documents and the missions here kept amazing records. Um, and also our, our second thing that we're wondering about is, you know, um, how do we keep ourselves within the scope of what our timeline is and our, our project involvement is that we, the thing we would like to do is reach out to the Pueblo and say, well, what is your side of the story? But we are limited um, within our scope. And so we're wondering how to represent the artifacts but also not close the door to other people representing their their portion of the artifacts and even people in the community. So, you know, there's, we have several churches within the community and several stories and versions of stories that are told regardless of the denomination. So it's a, it's, I think, a process that we're wondering what folks within other communities have experienced or those who are um, beyond the amateur archival level, level that I'm at <laughs> that can help us. So thanks for listening and, and taking a moment to consider it. Hi right. there. Um, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. All right, uh, it's Melissa. Um, you know, one of the things that we did at the State Archives um, and, and what you're dealing with is a very hard, uh, subject. Um, what we did at the State Archives um, was we put up a disclaimer because uh, you don't want to sanitize history because it is what it is. And that was the thought that was taking place whenever these create records were created. And if you start to change the record um, and take away some of those descriptions, then you're really changing that record. So the way we addressed it was we, we put up a disclaimer and said, hey, this, and I actually pulled it up, I'm gonna read it. Um, and it's descriptive captions for the, New Mex for the images in the New Mexico Department of Tourism photograph collection are themselves part of the historical record. These captions were created by the New Mexico Department of Tourism or its predecessor agency. When images became part of the collection, in many cases, the information provided is outdated. In some cases, the captions reflect ways of thought that may seem outdated as well. I mean, you can go ahead and use your own language, but again, it is really important that you maintain the record as it's created because you don't want to change. Um, again, I, I use the word sanitize history, um, and it's, it, I mean, we'd, it, that, that's just the way we handled it. And again, it's a hard thing. There were um, descriptions in that photograph collection that, you know, referred to uh, indigenous peoples as, well, not in a favorable light. So, so we, we just put that disclaimer up. You, you can't change history, it happened. And this was our way of, you know, addressing that issue. I don't know if Katie or one of the archivists on board has some other ideas. Yeah, I could weigh in, but I did see Patricia had her hand up first if she wanted to go ahead and weigh in before I did. I was, I mean, I was going to pretty much echo just what Melissa said exactly. You know, originally I was thinking of um, some of the recovery works. So we have a whole bunch of like Hispanic heritage recovery works where you have a lot of people um, you know, talking about indigenous folks that surround our communities um, in these incredibly negative ways. And while it's cringy when you're teaching it or when you're talking about it, it absolutely needs to be there because, you know, for the reason Melissa says exactly. And then also, because I think Adrian was gonna was pointing to this too, to inviting community into the conversation, because even though our focus is manitos.net, 
um, obviously we don't exist in isolation. A lot of us do come from indigenous communities. So we have to keep that door open. So it's like when you're talking about in Boodle, and you know, just down the way you've got okay, wenge, um, and we want to make sure that those channels stay open. So you know, a disclaimer is really, I think, um, really ideal. So thank you, Melissa, for saying that. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I I completely agree. The disclaimer is a. Uh, um... And that's the way a lot of, of institutional archives are going. You all have, may have seen it in the news a while back. There was some kerfuffle in DC because NARA has a um, statement like that, a blanket statement on their, their website. And it, it was, not everybody receives those <laughs> in the uh, spirit in which they are intended. Um, but I, I think, going to what Melissa says, just keeping the the integrity of the actual documents is so necessary. Because to me, one of the important parts of, of historical documents is that they are a means of accountability. You know, and so you want you want that, but you do want people to understand ahead of time what they might encounter in that. And I think where where reparative description comes in, is in the content that we generate now, the metadata that we generate now. You know, the original document needs to stay original. And when you're transcribing it, that can be hard too, <laughs> you know, but that, but it is what it is. But when we're creating our metadata, that's where we need to be careful about, about our language and about terminology that we're using now. That's where we can that's where the work of reparative metadata can come in um, and, and comes into a lot of a lot of this. And there, there are many task force out task forces task force task forces out there that look into this very thing and 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 people who spend a lot of time working on these issues because it is a huge issue and it's also an ongoing issue. We need to realize that's one of the things we need to keep in mind is that language changes constantly. And so we need to constantly be aware of the way we are describing materials. And that's really the difference, you know, the between, you know, what it what it is in its in its sort of unchanged form, the historical record, and then how we are describing it. And 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 the description would therefore include those those um, like the the disclaimers of the kind of content that are in them. That's my two cents. Thank you all. And I wanted to be sure and um, introduce Rosalie is on here um, as the Embudo Valley Library um, Square. <laughs> Hi, Rosa. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. I'm definitely taking notes on this. And if there's any way I can get that wording from the disclaimer so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and we have something credible that we're um, basing off of, that would be really wonderful, Melissa. I don't know if that's something you can easily copy and paste in the box or I can give you my email in the box, but um, thanks so far for the, for the input you all have given. There, there are other requests for it. So yeah, Melissa, you can figure out a way to get it to everyone. That would be good because there's other requests in the chat for it as well. Um, I, I just uh, want to say on, I guess, sort of a operational level, what it sounds like, and this is one of those like, why not all of it or any combination, but what might be a good discussion going forward to then is it sounds like we could think about a large blanket disclaimer for the archive itself. Um, and then everybody can think about disclaimers that they may or may want to not want to do in their metadata for their items individually or either per item or per collection or however. And I feel like a lot of your question as well, Adrian, when you first asked it for me was about how to handle it in the metadata. And I think at the time, maybe I said something or maybe not, or I might've dreamed that I said this and didn't actually say it to you that, um, you know, that, you know, this would go somewhere like a description field or something like that and just be consistently there. But there's a thing, and Melissa, this might be a thing that you might have a thought about is as we are finalizing this, you know, uh, 
the metadata template, I guess, which really ends up being actually, you know, what gets seen on every items thing. Do we, is there a field like perhaps in DAX or is there something that we can have just a field for disclaimers if somebody needs it? It'll be probably invisible if you don't use it, but then it pops up so that it doesn't clutter up the description field or something like that. So those are my thoughts. Yeah. And could be any combination of those things too. I have a. I was thinking. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my um my my question is going forward onto something related, but if it's directly related to the metadata, um, please go ahead. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is is uh, it's wonderful that we have this forum because I think. What we're going to find is um, different history coming from different areas. And so, yes, the disclaimer is very important, but I think it will, you know, give us a, a really good education on different sides of the issue. So that's what I was going to say. Good point. <clears throat> good point. Um, I had a... Um, I guess a follow up to that, it seems like having a, a field in the metadata that prompts this thinking is perhaps an important philosophical choice for the project. Um, so that if there's something that, you know, that it's like a reminder, you know, to all of us to take that into account rather than to kind of like, you know, have to remember it <laughs> or even as an, as an educational tool also for us when we're reaching out in our communities you know, because a lot of us are, um, are still learning, you know, and, and learning about changes and things that are happening. So um, I would support that, I think. Um, my question is a follow up to what, what was brought forward from Embudo. And we had a, um, an interview about um, Los Hermanos, the penitentes up here that have, that have, um, local musician Chris Ariano did with his Tio. And um, so it's not historic, it's not from the historic record, it's a direct interview. And there's some things that um, he said that um, it's, the interview is posted on the Quest of Stories website, but I, and I did not put a disclaimer up, um, but I, it needs to have that. I'm, my question is when somebody who is living now, um, gives a description of history that's either number one actually inaccurate <laughs> or um painted in a in a way that's that's inflammatory or almost does need a um needs like a disclaimer or some sort of thing it's um the challenge of not sanitizing an interview um because especially because this person is living and is a valuable member of our manitos community and then, uh, so it's a freedom of speech issue, but then there's also the aspect of um, respectfulness and, um, you know, and being accurate in today's world. So I'm curious what people would have to say on that because I think everything that's been said is really, I, I can totally understand and make sense. But then the challenge of, of this next level when it's not something that's already a part of the historical record, it's sort of like, in that funny liminal space where it's talking about history, but it's it's someone now. What what do people have feedback on for that? I have I have a bit of feedback. I'll jump in just for a second, and it, it's it is it's one of these interesting because this will be what this is is a lot of of uh, of uh, semantics somehow. Right? But we can dial it in, and I think we we can arrive at a really good place. And one of them might even be that, like you know, there's an aspect of disclaimer the word disclaimer itself that kind of implies a sort of a distancing or a kind of a uh, disowning of it, right? In sort of a way. And so in some ways, I kind of like the idea that we might think about this as context rather than disclaiming something. I mean, obviously some of the stuff that's just terrible, like you know, slurs from 150 years ago that are terrible, it's not like anybody doesn't want to distance themselves from that, but especially maybe with a living person like you say, Claire, an idea of context or a framework of context might be a way to go that helps 
nuance that a little bit, perhaps. I, I might, I mean, this is sort of a philosophical <laughs> argument, but I might make the argument that that is the historical record. You know, records that we create right now are the historical record uh, going forward. So, so I, you know, just from a philosophical standpoint, I might make that argument anyway, but I would also say that I, no matter the source of the document, no matter how old it is, it could still be full of inaccuracies. And I tell my students this all the time when, when we're talking about primary sources, that just because a document is historical doesn't mean that it's true. So, you know, the current oral history may have factual errors in it, but so might, an, uh, you know, an oral history or a diary from 100 or 200 years ago. So it, that's a whole nother level of, of you, you know, are we going to get into fact checking materials? Um, because then you don't just stop with current materials. You know, uh, you know, just because something's old doesn't make it true or, or accurate. Um, and so I, I kind of take that forward into, into current um, um, documents and oral histories and things like that. Um, I don't know. That's just that's just what I think. Of, but I was thinking off the top of my head. I, I, I mean, what do you what do you all think about that? I don't think that I'm sorry, Claire, that really doesn't solve your problem at no, all. I think that, that was I just think more of sort of a philosophical little um, rabbit I chased there. I think it's I think it's very relevant. You know, this it's the interview of his is which, you know, people can um, uh, can find it on our website. Um, it's um, I just have to double check. I'm getting his last name right in one second. I'll put the link in the chat. But um, um uh, i it's a, this combination of like really personal experience which i totally hear what you're saying about it being the historical record and i've actually been a really big proponent of that shane can attest to this that it's like i want to upload stuff that's happening now because it very quickly becomes historic you know um down the line you know like even from my own childhood that's historic now, <laughs> you know what I mean? In this, in this place, you know, like some for, for people. So um, not, not maybe technically, but it just very history time moves on very quickly, you know? And I, I totally hear what you're saying. And it's so important because we do have that distancing of, um, and, and I don't think that we do fact check or think of things as being potentially flawed as often. Um, but I don't think that's our job right now, you know, it's something that we have to, so like the concept of fact checking doesn't feel like that's, um, but there's in this interview, it's just sort of this little summary that he gives of like, you know, the, colon the, the colonial history. And it's so just kind of amazing. <laughs> Let me just say that, you know, and so um, it's, I, it just, it made me feel uncomfortable putting it out there without something. And I think I just, I'm just wondering what to do because I don't, I feel like a disclaimer would be disre disrespectful. And I mean, even just his age in a way um, is, is context, you know what I mean? That that's part of it. Um, but the, the, the word context is important, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to handle the situation without it being disrespectful. You know, and I actually haven't brought this up with um, Chris Ardiano, um, but I think that might be something that I should do with him, you know, um, a little bit. He's the one who conducted the interview originally. Um, what are your guys' thoughts about how to handle that kind of thing? And maybe it's a, it's a little bit of a case-by-case -case basis, you know, but thank you. What about a trauma warning? Just something that's going to say what this person is about to say could potentially cause trauma to a lot of individuals um, or to some individuals. And I think that it still allows them to have their, their view of history. Um, they get to be the author of their history, like we were saying. I mean, that is true. That is their historical memory of it or how it was passed down to them historically. And I think about the only thing you can say is that's their record, but 
this could, it's trauma. This is trauma, this could be traumatizing to people. I think a way to go that kind of starts to combine these sort of things, and this is again now feeling one's way towards a solution, right? Is, you know, a kind of a disclaimer can be something that is inclusive so it's not alienating because I'm, I'm totally hearing your concern, Claire. And I, I mean, I myself have that. I'm dealing with it on a whole separate way. You know, this way of how certain things get very disrespectful, but anywhere where it could go because then it's inclusive and it does address the trauma kind of thing, which is, uh, you know, that the kind of context might be something like, you know, uh, experience trauma can oca occasionally elicit very strong feelings or strong emotions and strong language, you know, this document contains something like that and maybe, you know, may, may elicit further strong feelings. Like this is terrible language, I'm obviously blind, but kind of go in that way. To, so, so the context starts to be how, you know, those strong feelings are a result of something else as well and really highlight the fact that this is a thing, this is a reality of the human experience, right? Trauma begets trauma and it could again beget further trauma and that that's how we can think about approaching something like that. Yeah. And I think, I think maybe, maybe we should be looking at it from a more um, collection wide, you know, angle, um, or, or, you know, in, instead of individual items, because, you know, if you put a warning on this one item, well, what if there's something in one of the other ones that you didn't catch, you know, that is, that is just as inaccurate. I mean, you know, it sounds like this one has like glaring issues, but there might be just as traumatic things in, in the other ones that you didn't particularly catch up, uh, catch on to, you know, and that's why I think like when, when Melissa was talking about, you know, that the, the, the state archives had sort of a blanket statement about these things. And then because there, there's a certain amount of work on the researcher as well that, you know, to, to uh, understand that going in. Um, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think, Melissa? Uh, you know, First, I agree with you totally that once you hit that record button, you, I, for me, you've created a record. <laughs> um, and um, you're creating, you know, a, an oral history is basically all autobiographical. You know, you're telling your story, your truth, your experience and your perspective of what has happened to you over a lifetime. Um, and it's it's complicated you know um but it is the record of that individual's experience i think someone else had said that earlier um and now that you mentioned nara's you know their disclaimer there's a, a full page of explanation and i think maybe everybody ought to take a look at that it's um nara's statement of potentially harmful content and it pretty much addresses a lot of what we're talking about right now. And it might not be a bad idea to, again, make something blanket that covers everything rather than just, you know, specific items, you know, look at it as a collection whole, as Katie said, um, because, you know, people are complicated and perspectives and everybody's had their own experience. Um, so we just have to be mindful of that and what, uh, your, uh, whomever you interviewed your, your interviewee's experience was, we have to be respectful of that and where he, he's coming from. So I want to point out to everyone, cause I'm monitoring the chat that Katie has put several examples in the chat of statements from different institutions. And I also wanted to point out that Amber put in the comments as well, which is kind of agreeing with both of you that the general approach is a good one. Like, and I'm a big fan of why not both. So maybe it is, we put a general disclaimer that covers, you know, and this is kind of the same approach we're taking with our, our copyleft protections and stuff. We will have a general disclaimer that covers everybody and everything. But, you know, I, I think it's, it follows along with our same philosophical approaches to, 
maybe create a field that allows for people if they feel like that it needs a specific context to be able to do that. Cause like, you know, and that's kind of what I'm hearing what Claire's saying is like, and then I, I, it sounds like this wouldn't be a majority of our material or even a huge large part of it, but it'll be something that it'll be nice to have the option for uh, the contributor to be able to, to, to add some context um, if they feel they need to. So I, I like that why not both meme with the little girl. So I, I, I'm, it's, I'm incorporated into my general philosophy of things of like, why not do all the options? But I know that's not always realistic, but yeah. Can, can I, I'm sorry to take up a, a more of our time. I have one more question, just a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, uh, Melissa, when you, you talked about the, you know, the record of their own life. And that's, I, I totally agree with you on that. And I think the challenge in this is there is autobiographical, I mean, you know, it is oral history, there are certain parts of it. And then there's another part where he kind of diverges and tries to kind of summarize the whole colonial history of the region um, in his understanding of it in this very, um, you know, he's, it, it, there's lots of shortcuts and inaccuracies in the historic record and then also just you know personal perspectives and things like that and um and yet that is what he believes you know he is saying it because he because he believes it <laughs> you know i mean there's no reason he would say it if if that wasn't part of his of what makes him who he is fully you know um and part of his faith and part of his patriotism and all the everything you know um so i guess that's the part is it's not just his description of say a traumatic experience of from his own life it's the you know it's kind of describing a history but it, perhaps it could be argued that they are not different <laughs> i don't know I, don't, I don't you know i actually don't think they are very different um because he's telling you in, in giving you that description he is telling you what he experienced and what he learned. Um, you know, are you Spanish? Are you in, you know, there's a, I don't know, I guess for us manitos, there's a lot, it's very complicated. You know, my grandma would tell you I'm Spanish. So I'm Mexicana, you know, there's a lot of context there, you know, and uh, um, yeah. I don't know what else to to say on that. I think it's all it all it's all entwined, and it does speak to his experience, mm -hmm. even his summary of what he believes, um, even the the incorrect um, facts. Mm -hmm. And it's I mean it's as much a result of our own educate you know like the general United States education system as well as you know cultural elements. Well, to, one thing. You know, okay. One thing I would say too that we haven't talked about in this your particular situation, and I, I think we shouldn't mind talking. You know, Claire, you're not by any means you're providing us with the opportunity to discuss these things, but you know, in some ways, I would say, you know, even if you're the uploader to the archive, that to not feel like it's your responsibility in some ways. And here's where I'm going with that is that, you know, and, and this is definitely a thing too, right? Part In some ways, you know, there's a multitude of um, uh, custodians of the story, right? There's him, he's the story. You're talking about it from your perspective, but now there's the interviewer as well, right? In a lot of ways, the interviewer as author, I guess you could say, would definitely be somebody you want in on the dialogue of how you want to approach this. So I, I think that that, and just generally, I'm, I'm bringing it up because I think this is a general idea where, you know, especially when it might be a case of this, where there's somewhat of an institutional, because I'm going to see this, I, I feel like this is going to be more, right? Where things are coming through, say, an institution like Quest of Stories or a platform or something like that, is often going to be, you're describing a predicament kind of in that way, right? You didn't make the recording. You're not the subject. You're uploading it on behalf of the community in kind of a way. And so you're feeling that responsibility. But in some ways, the disclaimer or maybe the context is more the responsibility of the author who either did the interview or the subject. And so I think 
a good approach that you would have is to talk to the interviewer and go like, hey, look, you and I both know there's historical inaccuracies or whatever, all the concerns and say, how do you want to approach this? Because I think that that's a, a level of agency, I guess, and the ability to have that, that response, take that responsibility as part of the agency, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Did I say something? Um, so I worked at another museum before I was here, um, African American Heritage Museum in the Plains, Virginia. And so you can you might imagine that a lot of our a lot of things in our museum, and this was 20 years ago, we were just doing documentation for um, just for records. And mostly it was births, marriages, and deaths. And so 90% of it is paper. You know, we don't have, you know, and this is before ancestry.com and whatnot. And it's before the big museum came in um, Washington, DC. And we had a lot of these issues because, um, you know, we had slaves, we had not in our county, we had indentured servants, we had, and you know, so the perspective was, was you know, some people got very angry on this, like, oh yeah, um, she was on the role of the slave, but she was sold into prostitution by her family. We had to buy her and raise her as a, you know, and they had documentation from, um, uh, you know, from diaries and letters. And that was, to me, that was original documentation that really changed the perspective of some of these stories. But yeah, we had to do the same thing, um, like do a general disclaimer on everything. We don't know how accurate this is and the, this information is. I don't really remember what it is. I'd have to go back, but yes, I understand. It's a, you know, it's a real challenge. and. Um, and thank you for bringing this up and addressing it. And I like that we want to do something maybe blanket and something consistent that, um, you know, anybody who opens this page, it's like, this is the perspective of this one particular individual based on his personal and his oral traditions, you know, from his family, boom. And I know that is a really difficult text to write. And I haven't even looked at all of your um, example statements yet, but I think it's going to be a real challenge. But thank you for, you know, thanks for addressing it. Jane, can I go ahead? Hello, everyone. This is Marissa. How are you? Hey, Melissa, it's been years since our boys were in choir together. Oh my gosh, is that you, Marissa, Marissa? Yes, it is. How are you doing? I'm good. Um, listen, I really appreciate the conversation we're having here. I do, I guess I want to just get some clarity because I know that um, whew, this conversation is big and I'm working on a project and we're dealing with this, the complexities of these narratives as well. Uh, and, and it's New Mexico Black history, which is actually a new thing in New Mexico, right? Um, as far as Manitos goes, um, we, I just heard someone mention agency. Shane, it might have been you. So I, I really appreciate this blanket statement. And then I also want to just um, get clarification. My role, I understood, is to archive photos and the uh, owners of these photos, the narratives they have for each one. And like Melissa said, um, I've got a funny story. We were coming back from Juarez and they wouldn't let us come back because my mom, my grandma insisted she would not say American. She would say Spanish American. They had to park us on the side. We sat there for hours because she just wouldn't budge. <laughs> but even though if you sat down and talked to her, she would talk about our mestizo. Like it was just the weirdest thing. So, okay, so what's my point? We've got to give people the agency to tell it like they know it. And, and, and New Mexicans, our people were racialized uh, on skin color. And so we were making choices to uh, be American <laughs> based on whatever the situation is or was in the communities where we're in. I can imagine my people, people from Puaca and Nambe, 
they were indigenous people, but did they choose to be American because they were redheads and, and, and güeros? Maybe. I mean, like, I just, we don't know all the complexities to the history, but I do know that you sit down and you talk to my family and they are not going to get the facts of history correct. They don't even understand that they were dehumanized, racialized, and treated like second-class citizens to accept the coercion and consent to be American white. So this is complicated. And so I say we do a disclaimer and then we just allow people to write it the way they know it for themselves. And it may not be historically correct. Um, um, so I, I don't know, there's a really fine balance there and I don't even know, I mean, I, I know we're gonna have different same opinions here and I see Patricia Perea here, so. <laughs> um, I'm guessing that Patricia, you're gonna you're gonna share something. So I I'm just I also don't want to get into this space of where I'm tiptoeing over trying to accommodate everybody because there's a problem in that too. So anyway, thank you. Can I say something? Um, yeah, Kathleen. go for it, Kathleen. Hi. Um, one of the things that attracted me to this project was the fact that the Manito community was going to be telling its story. And, and uploading its artifact. And I guess that different ones of us, because of our life experience, have different anxieties around talking about these really complex subjects. Um, I think just that. Um, I think the kind of history that you're told sometimes depends on who you are as a lister as well as what the other person is telling. So there are always, we've talked about one side and the other side. I think there are multiple perspectives. There are multiple perspectives on any history um, and they all speak to a perceived truth and that person's lived experience. Um, so I think the lived, the complexity of it is, should be represented. I'm glad that you brought that up, Kathleen, because actually it, it kind of, you remind us and you remind us to jump all the way back to the start of this project, right? And that there is a reality or actually, no, it's actually the opposite of reality or it is a reality, but a different way of looking at it. One of the foundational premises of what we knew was going to happen with this archive is that notion that of multiple truths, right? Of that even a simple photo would maybe have five different truths that need to all exist simultaneously, even if they're contradictory, because right. that is that. And so I, I feel like you're reminding us that this is something that's inherent to this project as a notion that, you know, that lived experience may contain contradictions and they may contain realities that, that, um, may not be true for somebody else kind of thing. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you said all that. Yeah, if we try to limit things to one side and then the other side, there's mm -hmm. pieces that are missing. Yeah. There's pieces that we'll miss. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, come from my own experience that when talking about these hard subjects, it's very often in terms of black and white. Mm -hmm. It's the black community and white what the white history that's been told. And I think it's much more complex than that in New Mexico. And if we back away from that complexity, mm -hmm. then we're also not revealing the truth. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to point out just because I'm monitoring the chat. Um, and so Rosalia, do you want to talk about your comment that is this one about that a lot of the resources that you saw were posted earlier have uh, something about removing harmful, harmful content, which um, is an option. I mean, it sounds like we're going the other way as far as the conversation and, and our commitment to sharing stuff, but I, I feel like we want to hear all the perspectives about this. So what is it you're looking at there and do and you want to talk about it or not? You don't have to. I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't want to talk. No, about it's it. totally fine. Um, just the first one, Black women's suffrage, and almost all of them that I went through quickly through the, the links in the chat, each of them had 
something on the bottom that said, if this content, if you, you know, here we are, we're saying like, there's this disclaimer, we don't support it. It, it may include racist comments. It may be homophobic. It may be all these other things. Um, and we've done our best to preserve the history as well as be mindful and respectful. But if you steal, if you still feel that this content is harmful, please reach out to us and we can work together to present a solution that works for everyone. And I think that's kind of a nice way of saying, hey, we're blanketly saying this. However, if you still feel that there's a problem with it, let's work together. That way we can honor them who have a, an issue with it and still honor the content of the archive document. I might have something to respond to that, but I just wanted to, to point out, Shane, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but Patricia's had her hand up for a while. I, so I wanted to, I, I wanted I to recognize that she's been waiting to say something. So. Oh, sorry, Patricia. I actually, Multiple screens. Uh, I was staring at that hand going, how do I figure out where this hand is coming from? Because I can't figure out. It doesn't tell me whose it is. So I'm sorry, Patricia. You should jump in like we all are doing, please, if you got to, because clearly that's how we were rolling today <laughs> anyway. So please jump in. Because yeah, I, I saw the hand and I'm like, I think that's from now. How do I find out whose it is? Because like I, I'm not clear on how that all works. So apologies. Yeah. No worries. I just hate to interrupt. I hate to like yeah. cut people off mid sentence. Oh, now I see where it's attached to your name. Okay. So now I <laughs> actually let me put okay. it down now. That way there's no no confusion. Um. So going off of what Kathleen said and what um, Marisa said, one of the things that I think is really important, um, is you know to contextualize it for a minute. We had the conversation in 2020 about the statues going down, right? And um, there was all this reaching out from, you know, mainstream US media about, well, what about the statues coming down in New Mexico, the obelisk, blah, blah, blah. And there's no equivalent. There is no equivalent between New Mexico and, you know, the statues coming down in South Carolina at all, um, you know, other than issues around class and race, but it's, I don't want to say it's more or less complex, it's just different. So one of the things that I was thinking is, um, and again, like I said, because my reference is always books, New Mexico has, you know, this long history, and I don't know if any of you saw the ancestry thing not that long ago with Henry Louis Gates, where he talked to Mario Lopez, and they were learning about Gustas for the first time, right? And that's something like we're all, I think, really familiar with here too. And so listening to the conversation, it's like, I think as, you know, we can do the disclaimer, um, we keep the document or the interview or the image as it is though, because I think otherwise, and I've thought about this since, since I've learned about this project, we can run this risk of romanticizing the Manito experience. So rather than do that, we document it as it is and keep the integrity of the project. Right, because it's like otherwise scholars will come to the page, whoever it is that's trying to learn will come to the page and see these biases of removing things that were complicated, excuse me, things that were complicated. And I don't think we want to lose the integrity of the project at all, because that's what I kind of, I don't want to say I care about the most, but it is a serious project and we want, we want the archive for our community for sure. But um, we also want to keep the document as is, because I was also thinking about that book. Um, I can't remember it right now, uh, Infinite Divisions, where, again, it's part of the recovery project where they have these narratives from like, you know, 19th century Nueva Mexicanas, and they're really disparaging Native people in those. And the document just stands as the document stands. And as teachers, educators, librarians, archivists, all of us, we're all able to talk about context. Um, so more than anything, I just think like we wanna keep the integrity of the project and that usually sits with primary documents as is. So I had uh, just one quick comment. So I have a muse the museum here at Ghost Ranch and I put up an exhibit about a woman who came up and she was trying to preserve the cultural heritage of Native Americans and the turn of the century, which was really, she had to have permission from 
Theodore Roosevelt to go around and to the tribes and ask them to sing their songs for her. And she would write it out. And then she um, wrote it out phonetically what he was saying. And underneath it, she wrote it, at, she translated into English. The reason why she did that was the children were taken from their families at age eight, not returned till they were 18. She wanted to try to preserve their cultural heritage, which was really forward thinking right at, by a woman right after World War One, and she got permission if she traveled with her brother. So, I mean, it was just a really good story, but I have this picture up and it says, uh, kill the Indian, save the man. <laughs> and it's a really, you know, and I wrote about the documentary about how, how Native Americans were um, forced to go to um, uh, dormitories. And I have people that come in that are only in their 60s that grew up in dormitories. And I, you know, I, I, you just feel, you know, even though I'm not from New Mexico, I feel embarrassed and, you know, I feel awful that this happened to so many people. And then I have, you know, people that come in, they say, oh, wasn't that bad? You know, and it reminded me of something that Marissa said about her grandmother that, you know, and that people don't, or when she was just before she was telling that story about how people don't even think that they were abused like they were and you know it's just you know and, and so i think that this is an awesome task for us to try to give people a venue to tell their stories whether you know we agree with it or not you know because personally it's like no sir you were abused you know but but he was saying yeah but i had running water and i was taught this and this okay so um i just think it's really important what we're doing and i do like you said, keep the integrity of the project of hearing, um, you know, recording perspectives of, of these people, whether we agree with them or not. Um, so anyway, that was just, you know, a thank you and Patricia, I like your, you know, I agree with what you're saying. And I think it's important to move, move in that direction. But that's just, that's just my perspective. Well, thank you. I mean, for I'll, I'll speak to it like a little tiny bit from my own like personal experiences. You know, I have a bunch of family who insists on Spanish, they're Spanish, they're Spanish, they're Spanish. And my joke is, can you see me? Because <laughs> like, I promise you, nobody has ever come across me and been like, you're Spanish. Never happened. Um, so it's like, you know, I've experienced that. And I've experienced like, you know, what it means, maybe not in this sense, but what it means to be a manita who did not get the opportunity to grow up in New Mexico, but was raised by New Mexican grandparents um, in a place like Texas, where it's incredibly racialized, where it's black or white, it's pretty much apartheid in that part of the state. And so like, if I'm thinking about my cousins who were raised in the same space, coming to a website like manitos.net and seeing these documents, um, I think it really opens their eyes to the complexity of their own histories, um, the complexity of race in general, um, because if you are growing up in other parts of the United States, this really is a conversation that is not had. Um, and like I said, you know, when it comes to the integrity of the project, it's like the other really good opportunity that we have with something like this, I think, and I'm looking at um, Marisa's you know, subtitle with Blackdom is we also have an opportunity to complicate the way New Mexico is understood even by New Mexicans um, and to get out of that, you know, tricultural Spanish, white, indigenous, we can have these conversations about race. They're super uncomfortable. Like my family gets all bugged if you say native, people get all bugged about, you know, there's hierarchies who's light skinned, who's dark skinned, who looks India. You know, there's these terms people use, negrita, negrito, all of those terms um, that are incredibly problematic. But like what Gretchen was just saying, you know, you can talk to my cousins who get called negrita and they're like, oh, that's just grandpa saying how much he loves us, right? Um, those kinds of things. So we can talk about it that way. But that's what's cool about leaving the documents as they stand. And I haven't listened to what Claire's um, referring to with the interview. But um, if I were to talk to my grandparents or my cousins, there's some really problematic stuff they say, um, but it has to be part of the conversation. Um, just again, like I said, um, the way I'm thinking about it for, 
you know, for actually recovering and keeping primary sources, um, you know, as complex as it is. I, I wanted to add to our toolbox of solutions as well, or just sort of remember or point out these things too. We've been talking, you know, a little bit about addressing items on an item by item basis and how we're going to do that or, and you know, the general thing. And I think we have a good approach with a lot of this, but I think what'll be good and interesting, you know, in sort of, you could say a second phase of the archive, once we've uploaded all the stuff we've all been working on for a while and it starts to operate as an archive, because we do know that there are going to be tools in the archive also that allow for additional context and things like linking a document that may have, you know, some things that are triggering or make people uncomfortable and and give context by contextualizing it within the archive itself. So to add to our toolbox, we don't have to worry about an item isolated on its own because the archive and work done curatorially even afterwards or people in their own. Now as, as Manitos as curators will be an opportunity to, to allow those things to not just gyrate in, isola in, in isolation, yeah. I don't, we don't want to get down into the weeds of crafting anything, but I just had this idea that if you use the word disclaimer, it sort of says we're taking this and putting it over here. And if the generalized statement becomes, we are embracing the, co the complexity, as opposed to we're disclaiming that we don't all believe this, if that could get framed in a positive framework, it really flips the thinking in a way that I would think might challenge a viewer. Without being all apologetic, is that what you're saying? Yeah, without being apologetic or without saying, well, this guy said it, we don't all believe it, but here it is. It's this person said this because it is part of the picture. Um, so it's sort of flipping it. I'm just thinking flipping the way the statement is made um, becomes less defensive. It doesn't sound like a defensive posture. It sounds like an invitational and an opening posture. Does that make sense? Yep, that's why I like the word context. Yep. Love it, love it, love Kathleen, it. That's so right on. I think that's because I would feel um, comfortable about um, Joseph Marquez reading that. You know, as opposed to this is the thing is I, I I want to think about everybody who would be reading this, and it's not that he needs to feel like cozy, <laughs> but I feel I feel that it needs to be inclusive um, of all this complicated thing that's happening, and so um, maybe it's I mean there's a lot of language that should be developed around it, but I think that tone from my experience of what this project is is founded on if that's in alignment with the founding of this project thank you does anyone else i, I have a sort of a suggestion at one point but i want to make sure everyone who wants to be heard on this gets heard and we, we've been jumping in and i apologize for Ignoring hand waving, which I don't know. Gretchen, this is your hand wave from before, right? Or is this now? Now that I understand how the hand waves work. I'm sorry, I forgot to take it down. No, see. I just wanted to make sure. I'm, I'm excited that I understand the hand waves. So now I'm like, you know, a person with a new toy thing. Um, <laughs> so, um, it, so I just want to make sure everyone has. So I, I think I want to recommend or propose to everyone that and I, I think M Melissa the, the the Nara statement as you all know I love Nara and and they're you know I, I see them as a lodestar so I'm very keen to see what this Nara statement of potentially harmful what was the last word of that Melissa materials or uh, harmful content content thank you and start to look at and, and I so what what I want to propose is that um, we'll start to work on this and we'll start to do that you know as far as uh, Manitos team or whatever, but I feel like this is definitely an area where we can all 
contribute. So as I think we should just start a thing, which is send in if you have an idea or a thought about this and you want to, this is definitely a thing that we should try to work towards together. I mean, I think we can definitely find just a disclaimer that's probably already been written that works really good. And then we can tweak it and sort of a thing. This has been an amazing discussion to me about this. And so I think that everyone's really thoughtful thoughts can go towards what we do end up doing, both for the general disclaimer and what we might do for any other solutions kind of this, because I think that, that I think we do. I think we had a, a fantastic discussion about this and that it's not over, but nobody has anything more to say about it at the moment. So I, I think- I just had one thing. Oh yeah, good, hi. Uh, hi just, just, yeah. hi. just what you just mentioned, I feel like kind of in passing, but that thing about where it goes on the website, I feel like is also something I'm really interested in right now. It's like, and, and kind of something to what Kathleen was touching on. Like if you start with that, it really changes the, the establishes a different context. Um, but then at the same time, it, you have to be, yeah, I think it, it just changes the, the effect of it, depending on where it is located. I'm really interested in, in and where and when that that comes into play if you have an yeah. initial thought about that like where you think it how it works no no i don't know i i'm just okay. cool i really interesting i feel like that's an, an important thing that, but i don't yeah I, yeah for so many projects it feels like yeah there's no it can be hard to find a place but i feel like yeah maybe it's a tab or something that says you know since I don't know what you call that heading cultural sensitivity or, or sensitive materials. And then you can get into that if you want. Um, Cause it feels like people are coming at it with so many different levels of trauma and stages of healing at that trauma and, and ways that, you know, mediates the relationship in such a different way. Cool. So yeah, somewhere between a big flashing strobing red box and buried in the terms of conditions <laughs> exactly. you to find the right place in between those two things. Yeah. yeah. You have to take a questionnaire first and then. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, but I think that's a good point because it is a thing like we'll probably need an about section and things like that, that may, and it may be a thing. I mean, just to think about a thing that we're thinking about and um, you know, of again, how, the archive itself gets embedded within minitos.net, which would be a website and things like that and where it is. But this probably doesn't need to be in the archive itself in some kind of a way, in a way that people will find it readily if they need to, are looking for it or need it or whatever happens. Yeah, yeah, good, that's good, yeah. Sorry, I'm just thinking now. So never mind. Ignore ignore me. I have nothing more to say about the about uh, that. Um, but there was something. So feel free to jump in, anybody, while I try to remember what it was and what Jordan just said that I wanted to say something about, and I forgot. Nope. Okay. Well, I'm gonna. I'll come back to it, Jordan. Whatever it was. I'm sorry. I, it was there and then flew away. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think that, I mean, I guess the easiest way at this point would be if anyone wants, finds examples that they really like or has language in particular they want. I mean, we, luckily we have this recording as a starting place in the chat and I've taken all kinds of weird notes. Um, but, you know, please send in those things so that we can kind of crowdsource this a little bit. And I think that we all can arrive eventually at something that everyone will be happy with. Um, as we as we debut the archive and things like that. So please, if you are so moved, please please send something like that in. Um, cool. And I will. I do like the idea of starting with the Nara statement. I'm I'm sure that it's awesome because I, they generally tend to be. Um, I there's I want to update everybody a little bit on where things are with the archive, just because we're getting close and we're moving steadily towards being able to have something for you guys soon. But um, other than uh, other than this subject that we've been discussing, does anybody else have anything um, metadata related or any questions that they had or predicaments that they wanted to bring to the group before we do something like that? 
Yeah, I guess that was quite a quite a lot. It's a good good thing for today, and I'm glad that we talked about it. But I guess it was quite a quite a bit, so we can percolate with the thoughts about this because I think it's an important thing to address. Um, next platica, we will have to start things off and just to think about will be Andres Aragon because when I talked to him individually, he had a lot to say of how he's been both struggling and overcoming struggling struggles with metadata and how it's been working for him. So next platica, we're gonna have them. And let's see, oh, we have dates, which I'll send out an email because I realize I don't know where I have them right now. So uh, we have dates for next month's Platica and for the meetup. Um, we're gonna flip them because I'm hoping that uh, we can have a Platica that includes the archive that we will all have access to, I'm believing by the next Platica, which will be probably in the second week of whatever next month is, March, right? Yes, we're in February, I think still. I, I sometimes forget these things. Um, so, uh, so that will be the case. Um, and so uh, I guess the update on the archive is, and you know, we just had a meeting about it today. Melissa and I had a meeting with Jonathan, who is the tech advisor on this. And so we are, the plan is to by Tuesday of next week, um, is to have the technical aspect and the metadata aspect of this kind of sorted out. So I'm hoping by the end of next week um, to optimistically be able to start to have logins uh, to where we're gonna do. And what we're gonna do actually first and to give freedom is probably uh, have an initial test run where people just mess around and then we're gonna wipe the entire thing again and then properly get everybody logins to start to really upload metadata. So that's why I'm hoping we will optimistically start to have. And th so that's why the Platica first, because I expect that hopefully by the next Platica, you will all have logged in and started to encounter issues and questions, and we will be able to address them at the next Platica, in addition to hearing what Andres has to say uh, about his experience. So it's all working forward. And I, so I hope that's all good news for everyone. So, and I will be touching bases with everyone, hopefully next week. I haven't sent out that started sending out all the emails. So hopefully by next week, we can start to, you know, talk about immediates and things and things really happening, which I, I appreciate you've all been very keenly patient about and everything. So, yeah. So unless anybody has anything else that they want to say, Melissa, Katie, any final thoughts about anything? Patricia? Oh, what? Yeah. One of the items we talked about earlier is, um, you know, depending on how comfortable folks are, um, I don't mind uh, venturing out and doing like some sit downs and one on one once you start entering um, metadata, uh, metadata, um, descriptive records. <laughs> I said, I told Shane earlier, I'm going to stop calling it metadata. Um, so um, if any of you, would like that. I don't mind. There goes my phone. I don't mind going to your facility and sitting down and doing a one-on-one, -on -one, especially when it comes to data entry, whether it's like one item at a time or in your Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I've had my two COVIDs, my booster. I've had COVID. I've got lots of antibodies on board. Thanks for reminding me, Melissa. I totally forgot to mention that. And I was really excited about it earlier, so I can't believe I forgot that, yes, the, I'm, it's an amazing offer for you to do that. And, and just to let everyone know, like that is gonna be the thing. We're so fortunate that Melissa is here that is, that is going to be basically the caretaker of the archive. And so her technical expertise is gonna become integrated within the build as it is sort of is. And really she's going to, you know, be able to train you guys better with metadata than all of my amateur tries because I am after all not a trained archivist as I am painfully aware of. So uh, it's fantastic. And I think you guys should take, take her up on this offer when you get a chance once things start to happen. Cause I imagine once we hit the reality of the archive we are all gonna have way more questions than than uh, we imagined that we had. So, so yeah, so I'm glad you reminded me, Melissa, and, and all the peoples, yeah. Um, let's see, yes. Um, so 
So Patricia, oh, that's where we were. Patricia, do you have any final thoughts or last words today? Yeah. I don't, I just wanna say thank you to Melissa. That's a great, um, great generous offer. I really appreciate it for all of us. So thank you so much. And thank you for saying that about metadata because I seriously have looked it up like what is this? Right, yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate it so much. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for letting me join your meeting today. And um, I look forward to hearing from all of you and to working more with you. I hope you keep coming to all of them. I I'm, will. I am going to leave us all on this note just because I want to point this out to Gretchen. Gretchen, I want to thank you for um, revealing to us how awesome it is to actually have pictures of dinosaurs hanging on your walls. I feel like I've deprived myself in life of this experience daily. And I think I might actually figure out a way to hang a couple of dinosaurs on the walls <laughs> of my house because it's going to make my life better. So thank you, Gretchen. Uh, seeing that in your office like blew my mind. So thank you. Um, and so on that note, I am going to say bye to all of you and see you in a couple of weeks. I'll send out the schedule for the next platicas. And thank you for this amazing, amazing discussion about this really important issue today. So uh, I'm glad we're all here and I'll talk to you all next week, I hope, or soon enough. <laughs>